All right, welcome to the Big Texas Podcast presented by Texas Young Republicans. I'm your host, Jordan Overturf, losing my voice. No, I do not have coronavirus. Uh, I just spent some time on the coast and I guess that sea air kind of got to me, but no worries. We are continuing on our uh, quest to talk to Republicans all about what is happening here in the state of Texas. Uh, and today we've got a special guest. My guest today is Colonel Hugh Shine, state representative from House District 55, covering Temple, Belton, uh, basically the eastern portions of Bell County. Uh, and I actually used to work for Colonel Shine. I ran a couple of his campaigns, was his chief of staff in the legislature, and it was good to get back uh, together with him, talk to him about what's going on with our economy, what's happening uh, in, in the legislature right now as we, we look at everything going on around us. Uh, but also, I wanted to talk to him specifically about what it was like in 1986 when he was the first Republican in that district to flip it. The first Republican since Reconstruction to flip a seat from Democrat to Republican. And, uh, you know, from there, what did he do when the Democrats were in control? What did Republicans do in Texas in order to gain the momentum needed to eventually take over the House in 2002? So I had a great time talking to Colonel Shine. Uh, he, he's a, a dear friend, and I really appreciate his insight on everything from property tax reform to financial markets. Uh, we recorded this last week uh, before the coronavirus stuff really started to tank the markets, before the Saudi Arabia, uh, Russian oil markets started to mess with everything. So, uh, we're a little behind the curve on this one, but still, I think it's relevant information and it's important for us to be, uh, talking about these things. What are we going to do as Republicans, as we look down the barrel of November and what is going to be coming for us as Democrats try to take control of the Texas legislature. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Colonel Hugh Shine. Do you prefer Colonel State Representative these days? What do like you I want? tell folks all the time, Jordan, you can call me anything you want to call me as long as it's not profane. All right. Well, I prefer er, Colonel. You know, I, I appreciate you and your years of service to the military, to the state of Texas. Okay. And uh, uh, so you, you're one of the lucky ones that escaped without any challenger. So you're riding through 2020, kind of watching the field. Uh, as you sit back now, what do you think of this election cycle? It is um, a very interesting election cycle. It is uh, all oriented uh, toward the redistricting issue, and that's what it's all about. That's why we're having the influx of money coming into Texas. That's why the emphasis is being placed by the Democrats to in the urban areas. And that's also why we have a response from the Republicans of trying to counter it. And it is a battle uh, in the political arena. Uh, you have lived in this state all your life, uh, aside from you know when you were deployed overseas. But did you ever think you would see a day in Texas when candidates would be coming, not only just from all over the place, but I, I saw a story today. There's a guy challenging uh, Michael Cloud down in the Victoria area who was running in a congressional here in Texas and in California at the same time. Fun, I, I couldn't believe it when I read the article. I didn't know you could even do that. I, I, and I don't think you really can. I realize you can run for a congressional seat anywhere in the country. Yep. You can live in any state you want to live in. You could live in California and run for a seat in Texas. You could live in Maine and run for a seat in Montana. But I didn't know you could legally run for two different seats in two different states. I, I mean, it just boggles the mind. Uh, and, and even uh, the last minute change in Brad Buckley's race, uh, the person they had right. uh, that was going to run there wasn't from that district at all and ended up deciding to make a change and challenge Don Buckingham at the Senate level. So, uh, I mean, can you believe that there are all of these seats where these outsiders are coming in and trying to tell Texans how we want our state run? Like it, it's all about redistricting, Jordan, because what the, what the influence is, is Texas is going to pick up three congressional seats probably okay. in redistricting, in, uh, in, in the census. Yep. That's going to put us number two behind California in the number of electoral votes, which is how we elect the president. Yep. So if we influence 
uh, the legislatures and we influence down the ballot, it means that you can influence the possibility of how that state is going to vote in the presidential election. And I believe it's, it's a known fact that if Texas votes Democrat with its uh, statewide election mm-hmm. and the electors vote have to cast their ballot for the Democrat candidate for president, we will no longer elect a president on the Republican Party. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's no longer just about Ohio or Pennsylvania or Florida. Texas right. is It now- is Texas because we're gaining numbers. We've been a strong red state for so long, and we haven't voted, I think, for a Democrat for president since Carter, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, and in order for the Democrats to have any shot without really struggling, they have to turn Texas, and that's what it's all about. So uh, from your standpoint right now, do you do you think that Democrats have a chance to turn Texas? Yeah. Not this round. Yeah. They're going to really give it a strong shot. They're going to spend a lot of money and they are going to change some of the uh, 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 dynamics in Texas at the legislative level. Mm -hmm. They've already done it in the judicial level down in Houston. Yep. Uh, They'll do it more of it in the urban areas. And that's where they're going to start. That's where they have the best opportunity. They're not going to touch rural Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, that's, that's just not going to happen. Not yeah. now. I'm not sure it'll happen even later on, Yeah, but they can certainly influence the, uh, suburban areas around the urban areas and the inner city areas of Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. I mean, as we talk about, you know, the electoral college and Democrats at the federal level really like to talk about busting that up. We look at the state and the number of counties that vote Republican far out uh, outweigh the number of counties that vote democrat does it seem like a fair representative process to have all of those folks in the rural sticks uh be controlled by you know a handful of maybe 30 counties well i'm not sure that it's 30 i'm not even sure if it's that many but uh uh as far as um i I guess uh, to understand your question you're are you talking about how the state ends up with its with its vote for president no i'm talking about just uh at the state level not even well what's- it, it, it's all based on population so uh, and that's a given that's the way it's always been so as more people migrate to the urban areas mm-hmm. they're going to get more representation the rural areas are going to going to have to expand and cover more rural areas uh, more more rural texas and we're going to have fewer and fewer rural elected officials and more urban elected officials and it's uh, that's that's where we're going and at some point in time we're going to find texas to be um uh really uh tough to maintain as strong a uh conservative red uh picture as we've had for so many years yeah uh, unless something happens and changes those suburban areas where they start becoming more conservative mm-hmm. right now that's not happening but it's all it's a cycle Mm-hmm. I mean, we're in a cycle right now where things are going pretty well. The economy is good. Uh, we have a lot of migration coming into Texas from outside the state. Yep. People think differently. Uh, they're going to the major urban areas. That's increasing the population there. And obviously, that has an impact on the vote. And and both sides know that. The Republicans know it. The Democrats know it. That's why there's such a fight this time to try to protect. Because whatever decisions made on redistricting this next round in the legislature, we're going to live with for 10 years. Yeah. That's that's enough time to influence the cycle mm-hmm. and everybody knows that yep and that's why uh democrats are certainly out for blood and that's one of the reasons i wanted to have you on the podcast was because you have actually experienced this from the other side back in the mid 80s when you were part of that republican wave that was starting to surge leading up to 2003 when they uh, eventually took over the house but you were there running races you flipped your seat for the first time first time since reconstruction yeah uh that was it was it it sent shock waves i was the only republican pickup in 1986 and i was number 56 and the only thing republican and and the democrats had control of the senate and the house Mm -hmm. they had the speaker of the house they also had the lieutenant governor we did have a republican governor with bill clements yeah so the only thing that the demo that the republicans could do was to give Clements veto protection. Yeah. And that was how we governed when I was in the legislature for those six years back in the 80s. Yeah, uh, and I uh, recently heard a podcast with uh, uh, former Speaker Craddock who was talking about some of those same things they had to do even uh, preceding that. Right. 
you know uh so i my question to you is what do republicans need to do right now and what was what do you think was the key to your success in the 80s when republicans were on the downside of things well my the key to the success back in the 80s was obviously being a conservative with convictions yeah okay uh limit state government growth uh limit taxes and look at doing those things uh in government that uh uh were business friendly Mm -hmm. okay uh such as um uh economic development such as uh, uh, uh dealing with water issues back then we didn't really have issues of water per se mm-hmm. but you need to look 20 30 and 40 years down the road of how the growth is occurring and think about it. so when i was in the legislature we created the rainy day fund which yep. we call the economic stabilization fund when we created that we thought the the fund might have a hundred million or two hundred million dollars and it never dreamed it would be in the billions but we were facing a financial crisis in 1987 uh, and then again, somewhat in 89 because of the oil and gas industry. And the, we were so dependent on oil and gas revenues back then. We were short money. Yeah, back in the 80s is when Texas saw an increase in the gasoline tax, the sales mm-hmm. tax, and, and some other features that were there. So we were looking at putting together policy, public policy, to try to preempt some of those things from occurring again in the future. Mm-hmm. We were successful in putting them into place. It took It just took years before the implementation of those things ever started uh, gaining any credibility and and any likelihood of being, hey, this is uh, good public policy. Glad we have this. Yeah, and it it certainly set Texas up to be the miracle it is today, right? Uh, Absolutely. Last week, the governor accepted the eighth consecutive governor's cup for economic development. So uh, do you think that... Those on the left who grew up in this type of Texas, where the economy is booming, 10th largest in the world, uh, third largest energy producer, they have become too accustomed to this idea that our economy is robust and, you know, the revenues that the state does bring in are significant, but they haven't been through that, uh, that significant down period. Even 2008, I don't think was... You tell me, was it nearly as bad as what we experienced in it the was, 80s? It, it was it was an issue of liquidity in the financial markets more than anything else. Okay. That's really what 2008 was all about, liquidity in the financial markets. Mm-hmm. Once the liquidity issue in the financial markets was addressed and, and, and we put in place some of the things we put in place – probably should never have been done, but we did emerge from there because we did respond to that immediately by reducing interest rates and and some other things that we did Mm -hmm. responding to that that helped us to recover. We recovered rather quickly considering the the magnitude of what what happened in October of 2008. Yeah, Uh, and to get back to my uh, original kind of thought was, do you think that now that Texas is doing great. Economy's great. Jobs are up. uh, That Democrats are getting to spend happy based on on what's down the line. It's human nature. Okay. If you haven't experienced a storm in your life, you don't know how to prepare for it, and you don't know how to live through it, and you don't know how to recover from it. Mm -hmm. So if Democrats, simple. Well, and we certainly know uh, some of the policy targets if Democrats take over. But I think one of the things that Texans are are very concerned about is our spending habits. Uh, you know, this session the legislature passed a two hundred and fifty billion dollar budget. Can you imagine? Could you imagine that in nineteen eighty six? Oh no, not at all in nineteen eighty six. In fact, um, uh, I was one of the strong proponents in speaking against. Uh, uh, some of the things that happened uh, in the uh, in the budget cycle when revenues were raised, and we uh, we we spent money back then probably uh, irresponsibly. Mm-hmm. Government spends money irresponsibly anyway because government's inefficient. Yeah. Okay, that's a fact. You got to accept that fact. So what you do is you look at at the process of appropriation. And say, okay, I know government's inefficient. You and I. For every dollar of revenue we have, that dollar of revenue probably satisfies a dollar of expense. Mm-hmm. But in government, it probably takes a dollar and a quarter to a dollar and a half to handle the same dollar of expense because of the inefficiency there. I don't know what that number is, yeah. but I know it's not one-to-one, mm-hmm. okay, because I've seen it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw it in the military. I see it uh, in state government and definitely is in federal government with no question at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a lot of folks are not numbers people either. Yeah. And if you're not a numbers person and you're more oriented toward uh, public policy that deals with social issues or issues that don't have anything to do with the capital uh, development of business and industry and, and the and the economy and the side, then you're 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 there. But it and then who knows where your vote's going to be in trying to satisfy some of those issues. Yeah. What I do in the legislature uh, on some of the financial issues is I go around to some of my uh, colleagues, Democrats as well as Republicans, yeah. and try to explain to them why something that's physical is important for them to either vote for or to vote against mm-hmm. and explain it to them from a numbers perspective. There are a number of Republicans that would come to my desk or I could walk over or they would watch how I voted and and I could always count on them to be right there alongside of me to try to make sure that we were making the physical side of government more responsible, more efficient, uh, more effective. Uh, But you still have that contingency of folks out there that, number one, whatever the budget is, is never enough. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Then you also have the far right – uh, in government, that whatever it is, is always too much. Yeah, There is a happy medium somewhere in between, and it takes effort to find out where that is. Well, and that's why we have four spending limits here in the state of Texas, right? Exactly. And, you know, this last budget cycle, the reason the budget was, I want to say, busted like it was, was because of public education. Yeah. And I go back to 1986 when we had the, uh, the lawsuits that were there, Edgewood versus Kirby. Mm-hmm. I was in the middle of it because I'd just gotten in the legislature. The lawsuit had just been finalized, I think, by the courts a year or two years before or somewhere in that ballpark. And we were dealing with that during the legislative sessions. And it continued through the 90s, continued through the 20s, uh, and, and even into this uh, decade until the legislature finally took the issue out of the hands of the courts by putting enough money into public education to basically get the courts out of the play. Yeah. And that doesn't mean lawsuits won't be filed, but I think it will minimize those lawsuits and what, and what, what kind of depth they may have, uh, because of what we did. But had we done some of those things the last 30 years in an incremental basis, we might not have had to bust the budget to try to get public education out of the courts this time. Yeah. I, Speaking of of HB three and that huge influx, uh, I've heard detractors who are out there trying to slam it. Some of the very people who voted for the bill. Uh, uh, my question to you is: uh, someone who has seen this issue for the last thirty years has watched it develop. Did the legislature get it right this time? I think it's too soon to tell. Okay. Uh, it just went into pl- It just went in in force on the first of September. Uh, so we've had what uh, six months. Uh, to see how it's working. Obviously, um, there are some issues that are out there because I'm already hearing from some school superintendents uh, of some issues that we're going to have to to take care of. And uh, But I think after a full budget cycle, uh, we'll have a better idea of what needs to either be tweaked, what needs to be changed, uh, what does work, what works well, mm-hmm. and what can we do to enhance the things that work well and how can we correct the things that don't. Uh, to that end, uh, when you talk about school finance, property tax reform is right there alongside it. It certainly was during the session. Uh, as you look at what we got out of SB2, what is your take on, on the property tax reform measure the legislature What passed? we did with House Bill 2 is we increased the number of tools in the toolbox for the taxpayer. There was no property tax relief in House Bill 2. What there was was an enormous amount of transparency in the process that we put in the toolbox if the property tax payers, you, me, and everybody else that live here in the state and pay property taxes, uh, have to at our disposal to try to minimize um, the impact of increased property taxes on the property we own. Yeah. Now, if folks don't use the tools in the toolbox – they're not going to experience any kind of any kind of change or or anything in, that benefits them whatsoever. But if they do pull the tools out of the toolbox, so to speak, the transparency, the appraisal review board issues, uh, all those kinds of things, and they know 
who is raising their taxes because the new statements are going to provide so much information this time as to each line item entity that has a property tax that they have to pay. They'll know who it is. They'll know what the rate is. They'll know what the rate should be if there's an under the no new revenue column. Mm -hmm. So that will tell them if the rate changes, who changed it. And if it went up, you know exactly who went, who it went up with and how much, if they did lower the rate, you know, who lowered the rate and you can see if the rate was lowered enough so that there was either no new revenue or it stayed below the the threshold that it's supposed to stay under, you know, when the public hearings are going to be, you know, where they're going to be. And you know the process that if you want to protest your property values of what that process is, and you know the dates and everything that you can uh, uh, spearhead your efforts uh, to protect yourself. Um, it'll be interesting to see this round because it is new yeah. if anybody really utilizes those tools. But I think over time, and it may be another year, uh, as people find out and people share it in their neighborhoods, hey, I did this, I did this, I got my, uh, I, I went through this process. I've gone through appraisal reviews. I've even gone through arbitration deliberately mm-hmm. so that I could experience what the process was so that in the legislature, I would be able to try to craft policy that would improve it for the taxpayer. And I deliberately did those things so that I could experience that. I had a beef for one thing, just like any other property taxpayer. I wasn't uh, too optimistic, but I was successful to some degree. (laughs) But what it did for me is it gave me firsthand knowledge, firsthand experience of here's what needs to be changed to make this better for the taxpayer. As you look at SB2, what do you think was the biggest victory for the taxpayer? Truly the transparency aspect of it. Outside of that, I'm not sure there was a whole lot. Even the cut uh, down to 2.5 in terms of the rollback rate? You know, I looked at the rollback rate, and I looked at municipalities across the state. Mm -hmm. And municipalities across the state, were there may have been a few in some of the large urban areas for sure but nobody was really violating and uh, uh, uh nobody none of the municipalities i saw were really out there really trying to increase their budget uh by large single digit percentages yeah. uh approaching the eight percent each time uh, i would say that most folks were somewhere around the two and a half to three and a half four percent range mm-hmm. there was a reason for those that might have been above two and a half uh, some of the municipalities that were really growing yeah. because of law enforcement needs and fire uh, protection needs and some other things like that, particularly counties, because counties have the responsibility of indigent health care. They have the responsibility of, of indigent uh, um, defense. Uh, defense. Yep. Those are expensive. Yeah. And if you've got a county like Bell County that's going to hit 400,000 people and you have the jails full, with uh, the folks that are there. And by the way, on indigent health care, if you're incarcerated, the county has to pay your health care, regardless of whether you have health care with where you work, or even if you're a military retiree or a federal retiree and you have health insurance through those systems, it doesn't pay. The county has to pay. And a lot of folks don't realize that. I do. I know that. Mm-hmm. And so consequently, knowing those things, you look at uh, constraints that are put on and you say, hey, wait a minute, we we got to think smartly about this. Uh, so that we don't put uh, our local governmental entities into a quagmire that they can't get out. Uh, And and so um, uh, there's no question that uh, in the 85th session uh, previous to this one, I supported 6%, and my whole approach was, hey, it's at 8, let's drop it to 6. If 6 isn't good enough, let's come back to next round and drop it to Mm 4. Okay. Uh, but that wasn't what the approach was this last time. And we're just going to have to see if it works, but it doesn't take effect till next, next, uh, uh, budget cycle. So what did all the municipalities do this cycle? They all went to 7.99%, which none of them have been doing for any of the years since, uh, it was at 5% or whatever back in the late seventies or yeah, the late seventies when Mm -hmm. it was around 5%. And so the majority of municipalities across the state all increased budgets by 7.99 percent yeah because they know they won't be able to do it next time and so what we did is we created a euphoria of hey let's go do this and have this extra money and it'll probably be rat holed somewhere or spent on things that maybe it didn't need to be spent for and that's that's an injustice to the taxpayer in my opinion 
Well, uh, and following that trail, what do you think is the new, the next frontier in terms of property tax reform, relief, whatever avenue you think uh, the state will take? That's the multi-billion dollar question because we fund local government in Texas with property taxes and uh, some levels of government like your cities and your counties have a sales tax available to them as well. As long as we have an issue in Texas where we are funding, primarily funding local government with property taxes, it's going to always be a major debate. Mm -hmm. But we have another issue out there. We have a supply-demand problem, okay? So here's what we're, where we are. In 2008, we had a financial crisis because we allowed people to buy houses on unemployment insurance checks to qualify to buy a house. Yeah. Ridiculous. Okay. And so we got ourselves in trouble as a, as a nation across the board. Okay. Well, now it's turned the other way in order to get a mortgage. Now you're going to have to put 20% down. You're going to have to have stellar credit. And, and by the time you get done with all the paperwork and everything and all the closing costs and what have you, you're going to shake your head and say, this is ridiculous. Okay. Then that's one of the issues. Cause that's a deterrent. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second is, is labor shortages in the construction industry. We experienced that with Hurricane Harvey. We still have places down along the coast that are still trying to recover two and a half years later because they don't have the crap. They don't have the craftsmen uh, to rebuild some of those areas. And uh, and then you have a supply demand side where you got more people moving into Texas, more people wanting housing, and you can only build so much so fast. And if you got a shortage of people to build, so we have a demand for X number of houses, but we only have an X number of supply. Well, guess what? When you have more demand and supply, what does that do to prices? It's a simple economic uh, calculation. Yeah, prices are going to go up, mm -hmm. and they're going and they're going to keep going up. Mm -hmm. um, so until we can rectify some of those things, and I'm not sure how that's going to have to occur. Uh, obviously, if people start moving out of Texas in droves, which we don't necessarily want to happen, then home prices will probably drop which will affect appraisal values, blah, 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 and you go on and on and on, and uh, and that might occur. But that's not going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, I, okay. I, I don't see the Texas yeah, miracle it's, slowing it's, down. It's, it's not going to slow down. And you got municipalities out there that are doing a very good job with their economic development corporations and reinvestment zones of bringing in industry from outside the state because of the structure in our state. But really and truly, if you take the property tax issue and the sales tax issue and you put it in a category where you look at total taxes that individuals pay, Texas is really close to the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's just that we only have two, two, wares, two places that you pay taxes, sales tax and property tax, because we don't have an income tax and we're not going to have one. Uh, whereas almost every state, 43 other states, have property have uh, income taxes and some states have income taxes at the city level the school level the county level and special district levels there's about seven or eight states that you pay property you pay uh, income taxes at multiple levels mm -hmm. and i guess about the only way you don't pay income tax is you just are indigent I, that's the only thing I can think of, yeah. and they might even charge you income tax on <laughs> on on your welfare check. I don't know, uh, but uh, I've looked at that uh, because I'm trying to figure that out because I intend to return to the legislature and be involved in the same issue to try to figure out how we can make the tax dollars that we have uh, as efficient as possible, effective, and uh, buy as much for us as we possibly can. Uh, as we wrap up here, though, uh, one last thing I wanted to talk to you about is the economy. Now, I am not an economic expert at all. And you work in the financial services industry and you're looking at the stock market every day. You're looking at jobs numbers. Uh, it, it seems like right now when you talk about the the positive outlook of the economy, a lot of people on the left want to go ahead and bat that down. They want to say, no, it's not real. It's not true. As someone who works in this industry, what is the real message on the economy right now for Americans? We probably have one of the healthiest economies I've seen in my adult lifetime. Uh, you've got a 10-year treasury that's down right now to 70 basis points. A lot of this is because of the uh, anxiety over the co coronavirus uh, issue. You've got the stock market that's all over the place. Uh, one day we think that we got a handle on the, on the virus, another day we don't, and so that's all over the place. But here's the bottom line. Businesses, uh, this past quarter, at the end of 2020, uh, or 2019, rather, uh, 
you had <clears throat> roughly 75 or 80 percent of businesses uh, across the United States that either met or exceeded uh, revenue goals and or profit goals. OK, mm -hmm. that's exceptionally strong. Uh, you've got companies that are employing people. We've got a three and a half percent unemployment rate. But what a lot of folks don't pay attention to is the number of people that are coming back into the workforce that have been on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And that percentage is increasing, which means we've got more people coming off. I would hope the welfare rolls getting onto the payrolls. And that means those folks are actually becoming producers of tax money in society. And that's a good thing as well. So we're increasing jobs. We're increasing the numbers of jobs. And I really think this uh, trade and tariff fight that we've been in with the president and foreign countries is, is getting a lot of, um, um, a lot of headlines but what folks need to realize is America has been a tariff nation since our creation under George Washington. Yeah. One of the first acts passed in this country was the Tariff Act in 1789, if I'm not mistaken, by George Washington. And we were a tariff-related nation. We had tariffs in this country. That's how we funded the Civil War. Yeah. That's how the, the Union funded the Civil War was with tariffs. OK, that was also part of the problem that the union had with the South was on tariffs, too, because of commodities. Yeah. And we continued with tariffs all the way up to World War to the end of World War Two. And here's what happened at the end of World War Two. We took tariffs off because America was the only country left that had any industry. Mm -hmm. Japan was destroyed. Germany was destroyed. Europe was destroyed. Russia was Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all those countries had to be rebuilt and putting tariffs. They didn't make anything. Yeah. So what were we going to put tariffs on? Okay. Yep. And so we took tariffs off. And then as we rebuilt Japan and we rebuilt Germany, we rebuilt, rebuilt Europe, then as their industries came online, guess what? They came online with technology developed in the 40s, not in the late 1800s and early 1900s like America did. Yeah. Our steel mills we're 45 and 50 years old, et cetera, et cetera. So I can go on and on and on. All our infrastructure was old, but it was still there. Theirs wasn't. So guess what? You have countries in Africa, they don't have telephone lines because everybody's wireless. Yeah. And you have all these emerging market countries, they don't put up telephone poles. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh uh, you know, they have to do some things for, for electricity, but for, but for their internet and for telephone and all the other stuff, it's all wireless. Yeah. Oh, when I was in Africa in 2011 and 2012, you'd be driving out in the bush like hours. I'm talking to three, four five hours outside of the capital city. And there'd be a little shack on the side of the road. And you knew it was a cell phone shack because it was painted red. It had their little logo yeah. and there's people buying minutes out there in the bush. Of Africa. Exactly. And see what America's and what Americans don't realize is that's what happened to us in the 40s. And so from 45 all the way to probably nine, probably the 80s, we were rebuilding the rest of the world rather than rebuilding ourselves. And because those countries' labor was cheap, we were just importing their products and buying them, and we became a nation in, by 1990 that didn't make anything anymore. Mm -hmm. We were just buying it from everybody. What we have done in the last few years is we've turned that around. Yeah. America industry is back to making things again. We are, because of incentives, because of technology and everything else, we are reinventing industry in America, and we're bringing it up to the 20th, 21st century with technology, and, uh, and, that's, and, and that's a good thing. That's a great thing. And that's why I believe the economy in the United States is going to be the leading economy in the world going forward, barring any other world war crisis of some sort that destroys those other countries again or hopefully does not destroy anything that we have. And that's what I see. And I see the economy for the United States through the remainder of my lifetime being extremely healthy um, and, and beyond. Excellent. So uh, as we get out of here, what is your uh, final message to Republicans out there as they look down the barrel of November 2020? Number one, don't be complacent. Don't believe that uh, just because we've been red for so long, we're going to continue to stay red. Um, 
if you're in business, you need to be in politics, which means uh, you've got to get out there and support candidates who believe in uh, in capitalism, who believe in business, who believe in uh, economic development, and get out there and support them and try to help them return uh, to the legislative process or to Congress, because those are the people that are going to allow you to have public policy that will let you expand and uh, grow and be more productive uh, in the society that we have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Colonel. I appreciate your time today. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you again to Colonel Shine for joining us. Thank you to you for listening. As always, if you are listening on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you're getting this, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And uh, if you can, leave us a rating. It really helps uh, improve the ability for people to find this podcast. We want as many voters tuning in, listening to these candidates before they head to the ballot box. Uh, We've got more candidates coming up, uh, policy experts we're going to bring on. Uh, We're gearing up for state convention. We'll be monitoring uh, the response response from RPT. Uh, Kyle Watley sent out an email earlier this week letting folks know that they are preparing. They're being preemptive about uh, what they're going to do in Houston and create contingency plans. But for right now, (coughs) state convention, excuse me, is uh, still headed off without a hitch. Uh, Plans are moving forward. So we look forward to uh, telling you more about some of the interviews we're going to be able to bring you Uh, as it relates to state convention candidates, all those things. If you are not, make sure you're following us on Twitter and Instagram at Big Texas Podcast. As always, make sure you're following Texas Young Republicans on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Texas YRs. And make sure that you go out and vote. Right now, there's a YRNF poll for your favorite state federation of young republicans and we need you to get out there and vote go to the texas wire facebook page uh find that link we'll keep posting it make sure you go out there and you vote for texas young republicans the best young republican federation in the country all right i think i'm off my soapbox uh friends we will continue to bring candidates to you give you information as best we can as we get updates from the field but for now thank you so much for listening until then friends We'll see you down the road.